Why did the first United States Congress submit Amendment 1 to the Constitution, stating that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof and granting freedom of speech and press and freedom of peaceable assembly? Where did those people get those ideas and why did they propose them? Do you know? Stay tuned, we'll see. Welcome to Steps to Life with Dr. John Grossbaum. Sabbath rest is a promise between God and His children. Bible prophecy tells us that we are living in the last days of this earth's history before Jesus' second coming. Today's program will help you prepare for these coming events. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. In just a few moments, we're going to look at one of the most radical teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. But before we do that, let's pray and ask the Lord to guide us into an understanding of truth by His Holy Spirit as we study His Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for this infallible guide to truth and salvation. And we know that if we study this book and if we follow its teachings, that none of us will be lost. And we pray that you will help us to understand the truth as we study now and give your Holy Spirit to our minds, that we may hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking in the conscience and may be guided to an understanding of spiritual truth in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We would like to send you a free book entitled, When Religion Puts You in the Fire. To receive your free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC12. Have you ever wondered why so many people in history were deliberately burned to death? Why did this happen? To receive your free book, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC12. And now, Pastor John Grossball. In the Bill of Rights, in Amendment 1 to the United States Constitution, we read the following words. Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, or, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances." Unquote. That's just part of the amendment. Where did these ideas come from? Where did these people get these ideas and why did they propose them? Well, many people had come to America to escape religious persecution in various European countries. They had wanted to escape the Spanish Inquisition. They had wanted to escape the fires of Smithfield in England. They had wanted to escape the bloody persecutions of the Duke of Alva in the Netherlands. And it was only about 200 years since the St. Bartholomew Massacre when tens of thousands of people had lost their lives, not because they had committed any crime, but because they were of a different religion than the king. And so the first Congress of the United States decided that they wanted this country to have religious liberty freedom of religion, as long as this freedom did not interfere or infringe on the rights of others to have religious freedom. In this country, in other words, there was not to be a king. There was not to be any religious leader who could dictate to the people what their religion was to be. Actually, these ideas are much older than the United States Constitution. These ideas actually go all the way back to the New Testament times, to the time of Christ. Now to understand how radical the teachings of Christ were in His time, we need to understand a little bit about the kind of a world that Jesus lived in. In Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, the kingdoms of this world offered position and self-aggrandizement to those that were of the privileged classes. The people were supposed to exist for the benefit of the ruling classes. If a person had influence, wealth, education, that was just so many means of gaining control of the masses for the use of the leaders. The higher classes were supposed to think, 
to decide, to enjoy, to rule. The lower classes were to obey and serve. And so religion, like everything else, was just a matter of authority. The people were expected to believe and practice whatever their superiors directed. The right of a man to think and to act for himself as a man was completely unrecognized. <clears throat> and Jesus came and established a kingdom on completely different principles. Jesus did not call men to authority, but rather to service. The strong were to bear the infirmities of the weak. In Christ's kingdom, power, position, talent, influence, education, place the possessor under a greater obligation to serve his fellow man. Jesus told a parable illustrating some of these principles in Matthew 13. It says here in Matthew 13, starting with verse 24, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. That's the weeds. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now Jesus did teach plainly. You can read it in Matthew 18. Jesus taught plainly that those who persist in open sin are to be separated from the church. In other words, they are to be disfellowshipped. But he has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. If we were to try to uproot from the church those that we think are spurious Christians, we would be sure to make mistakes. Oftentimes we regard people as hopeless subjects, but Christ is drawing them to himself. There are many who think that they are good Christians, but they will at last be found wanting. Many will be in heaven that their neighbors thought would never be there. You see, man judges from appearance, but God judges the heart. The harvest Jesus talked about here is what happens at the end of the world, the end of probationary time. And in this story, we see how are we to relate to those in the church that we think are some way, in some way wrong in their teaching or their belief or their practice. They may be keeping the law of God, but we say, oh, there's something, there's something not right about that person. Their theology is wrong. In spite of Christ's warning, he said, let both the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. Remember, he's not talking about those that are living in open sin. But he's talking about all the professed believers. Notwithstanding what Jesus has warned, men have decided to uproot the tares. So, in order to punish those that are supposed to be evildoers, the church has had recourse to the civil power. And those that differed from established doctrines have been imprisoned. Not only that, they have been tortured and put to death. How? By the instigation of men claiming to be acting under the sanction of Christ. The trouble is, that is the spirit of Satan and not the spirit of Christ at all. That is Satan's method of bringing the world under his dominion. And what has happened in past centuries is that God has been misrepresented through the church by this way of dealing with those that are supposed to be heretics. Well, in the harvest, the tares and the wheat will become manifest and the angels will separate the tares from the wheat. Jesus did not say that the time would come when all the tares would become wheat. He did not say that. 
But he said the time would come when the angels would separate the tares from the wheat. And the tares would be bound in bundles and they would be cast into destruction. You see, one person does not have jurisdiction over the conscience of another person. The framers of the United States Constitution recognized the eternal principle that man's relationship with his God is above human legislation. They understood that the rights of conscience are inalienable and that it is not necessary to establish this truth because we understand it and it is this consciousness in our own minds in defiance of human laws that has sustained so many martyrs in tortures and flames. Because these martyrs understood that their duty to God was superior to any human enactment and that no human being really had authority over their own conscience. You see, it is the inborn principle that nothing can eradicate. But today, today in the religious world, there are multitudes who believe that they are working for the establishment of the kingdom of Christ as an earthly temporal dominion. How would a person or a group of people go about doing something like this? Stay tuned, we'll see. Sometimes studying the Bible on your own without any help or a guideline to follow can be a little difficult. And after confusion and frustration set in, we all too often turn to other things. If this sounds like you, you're not alone. The Steps to Life Bible Correspondence School is just the answer. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for your free Bible Correspondence Starter Pack. I really enjoy being able to study at home. I'm a new Christian and I definitely knew I needed some guidance. Simply review each lesson and answer the questions. These studies were great. It just seemed like the Bible opened up for me. Then send the completed lesson back to us in the envelope provided. These studies were very professional, they didn't take a lot of time, and I really appreciated that. A Bible teacher will then look over each lesson and send them back to you with the next set of studies. It's that simple and totally free. Call Steps to Life Television at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. I'm so glad I called. Welcome back. Today, as I just mentioned, there are multitudes of people in our world, in the religious world, who believe that they are working for the establishment of the kingdom of Christ as an earthly temporal dominion. They desire to make the Lord Jesus the ruler of the kingdoms of this world. They want Jesus to be the ruler in the courts, in the camps, in the legislative halls, in the palaces, and in the marketplaces. They expect Jesus to rule through human legal enactments that are enforced by human authority. And since Christ is not here anymore in person, they themselves will undertake to act in His stead and to execute the laws of His kingdom. Now incidentally, the establishment of such a kingdom is exactly what the Jews wanted in the days of Christ. In fact, the Jews would have received Jesus if He had been willing to establish a temporal dominion. Even the disciples wanted this. The Jews wanted Christ to establish a temporal dominion and to enforce what they regarded as the laws of God upon all peoples of the earth. They wanted Jesus to make them the expositors of His will and the agents of His authority. But when Jesus was accused, in fact, this is the false accusation. They couldn't get any true accusation to bring against Jesus, so they made a false accusation against Him what was contrary to what He had taught. And so you can read here in John the 18th chapter, it says uh, in <clears throat> uh, Jesus in the, talking to Pilate, it says in verse 33, that Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Are you establishing a kingdom, a rival kingdom to the Roman government? Jesus answered him, verse 34, and said, Are you speaking for yourself on this? 
or did others tell you this about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Now notice Jesus' answer, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Notice Jesus did not deny that he had a kingdom. He did not deny that he was a king. He acknowledged that he was a king and that he had a kingdom. But he said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not from anywhere around here. His kingdom that he was establishing was a spiritual kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, many Christians even have never analyzed that statement. Let's think that through for a moment. Do you realize that we're not saying this against any kingdom of this world? But the kingdoms of this world are temporary. We read in Revelation, the 11th chapter, it says that the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Notice, the kingdoms of this world are temporary. When the seventh angel sounded, we, re we read that in Revelation eleven fifteen. 15, when the seventh angel sounds, the kingdoms of this world are going to be over. They're going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. We're not talking against any kingdom of this world, but the kingdom of this world, kingdoms of this world are temporary. We need to recognize that. The kingdoms of this world, the governments of this world are not eternal. They are temporary. And Jesus' kingdom is not temporary. It is eternal. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. John 18, 36. Think that through for a moment. A kingdom of this world is not the kingdom of Christ. We're not criticizing the kingdom of this world. We're just recognizing that it's not the same thing. Any kingdom of this world is not part of the kingdom of Christ because the kingdom of Christ is not of this world. Jesus would not accept an earthly throne. Now, people say, well, we need reform. Well, yes, we do. They needed reform in Jesus' day. The government under which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive. In fact, on every hand in the Roman government where when Jesus lived, there were crying abuses. There was extortion, violence, intolerance, cruelty. And yet Jesus did not attempt any civil reforms. Have you ever wondered about that? Jesus did not attack any national abuses. He did not condemn the national enemies. In fact, Study your Bible. Jesus did not interfere at all with the authority or the administration of those in power. He was our example. We are to walk as He walked if we were Christians. And He kept aloof from earthly governments. Now the reason for that was not because He was indifferent to the woes and the needs of men, but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure for the human problem had to reach men individually and their hearts had to be regenerated. You see, you cannot establish the kingdom of Christ by the decisions of courts or of councils or legislative assemblies. We're not condemning any of those things. We're not condemning the patronage of worldly great men. But you cannot establish the kingdom of Christ by those means. How is the kingdom of Christ established? It is established by the implanting of the nature of Christ in humanity through the work of the Holy Spirit. Here's the way the Apostle John describes it in the first chapter of his gospel, John 1 verse 11 and 12. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. 
There you have it. It's through the implanting of the nature of Christ in the human spirit by the Holy Spirit that the kingdom of God is established. Concerning these people, John continues to write in John 1.13, he says that they were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. <clears throat> that is the only power, friend that can really work for the uplifting of mankind. That human agency that is used for the uplifting of mankind is the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. It is through the foolishness of preaching that God has ordained that anyone who listens and believes will be saved, as you read in 1 Corinthians 1. When the Apostle Paul began his ministry in the city of Corinth, a very populous, a very wealthy, and a very wicked city. A city that was polluted with all kinds of the vices of heathenism. He said this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. He said, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Writing afterward to some of those who had been polluted by the most foul sins, he made this statement to them. He said, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And he said, to them, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Today, just as in Jesus' day, the work of God's kingdom does not lie with those who are clamoring for recognition and support by earthly rulers and human laws. No. The work of God's kingdom is with those who are declaring to the people of this world in Christ's name those spiritual truths that will work in the believers the same experience that the people in the Corinthian church had. The Apostle Paul said to the Galatians, he said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And when a person has that experience, they become transformed. They become part, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit you are all baptized into one body. You see, you're not, he's talking there, the, the body he's talking about is the church, as you read in 1 Corinthians 12. I just quoted verse 13. By one spirit you are baptized into one body. You see, you can't really be part of the kingdom of Christ until you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, unless you have been, as Jesus said it to Nicodemus, unless you have been born of water and of the Spirit. It is impossible for you to be saved. It is impossible for you to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, after that happens in a person's life, then they can do the same thing that the apostles did. Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.20, He said, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. It was a wonderful thing that the framers of the United States Constitution and Bill of Rights did for the American people. It is because of the principles that they established that the United States became the greatest nation on the face of the globe. But prophecy is very strict and stern and truthful in predicting the future and what is going to happen in this world in the last days at the end of the world's history. Prophecy predicts that in the last days that these principles, the principles of the United States Constitution, are going to be repudiated. The principles of freedom of speech and freedom of the press and freedom of religion, 
Those principles are going to be repudiated in the last days of this world's history. The Bible is very clear about this. <clears throat> now, many people have said, well, that can never happen. We live in a free country. We have the Constitution. And so that can never happen here. But the Bible predicts that it will happen. As you study religious history, one of the most dangerous things that you find that any people can do is to think that something God said would happen in the world won't happen. When you study religious history, you find that all religious history is, actually all that secular history is, is simply a fulfillment of what God wrote about in advance in His book, in prophecy. And this is what the Bible says is going to happen to religious freedom in the last days of the world's history. We read it in Revelation 13. It says, He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which He was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Notice there's going to be religious legislation again. And He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. What does God think about religious legislation telling people how they have to worship? Well, God's response to this is found in the third angel's message in Revelation 14 in verses 9 to 12. It says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. What does God think about religious legislation? He says, if you, with all the light that has been shed in the world for the last 6,000 years, with all the light that you have, if you still persist in religious legislation, well, then you're going to receive of my wrath. Half of the book of Revelation explains what the wrath of God is. It's, it involves receiving seven last plagues and then destruction at the end, as you can read in Revelation 19 and 20. You see, friend, we need to think through what does the Bible really teach in regard to religion and religious freedom. It teaches that we all need to be faithful to God in our own conscience. We would like to send you a free book entitled, When Religion Puts You in the Fire. Simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer GC12. Can you imagine a time when your own government would tell you how and when to worship? It has happened in the past. When we study history, we can see many times when such a decree was issued. Will it happen again? Does the Bible predict whether such an occurrence will take place right before the second coming of Christ? If this does happen, will you and your family be ready? Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH to learn what will happen and what you need to do to be prepared to stand on the side of God. What will you do when your beliefs put you in the fire? Call and ask for when religion puts you in the fire, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788 and ask for offer GC12. And find out the truth from God's Word on this very important topic. Call now. May the Lord richly bless you as you continue to seek for His truth. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.